For everybody, welcome to our Earth Journalism Network webinar on zoonotic diseases. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is James Fawn. I'm the Executive Director of the Earth Journalism Network. And first and foremost, we'd like to wish all of you a very happy Earth Day. Uh, we do realize it's not the happiest of times for our planet and, our, and its people, but um, let's all give thanks for the life we're able to celebrate and especially give thanks to uh, the folks in the medical community and all the people working on the front lines in uh, essential jobs to keep us healthy and fed and informed because of course, many of you journalists out there, you also are working in essential jobs and uh, we very much appreciate your work uh, keeping us all well informed about the pandemic and and everything related to it. We are very happy today uh, to be joined by a team of researchers uh, from the USAID Predict and Preempt projects. Uh, they're working to detect and contain viruses out in the field, and I'm sure they have a lot of interesting experiences to share with us. Um, I'm going to turn it over to them in just a moment, uh, but first, uh, just a few words about the Earth Journalism Network and who we are and what we do. Um, in case you're not familiar with us, we are a project of Internews, a global media development organization. And we're also a community of over 12,000 journalists from more than 180 countries. We're all dedicated to improving the quantity and quality of environmental coverage around the world. Uh, you can find out a lot more about us on our website at www.earthjournalism.net. And certainly encourage you to check that out. And if you're a journalist, feel free to join. Uh, you can register on the website. Registration is free. We have a lot of activities and opportunities that can help you do your job. Um, this webinar is one of a series of, of uh, webinars that we are holding uh, about zoonotic diseases and about their environmental origins, uh, particularly uh, in the wildlife trade and other uh, other forms of ecosystem disruption and uh, that are helping or are causing a lot of uh, viruses and other pathogens to spill over into human populations. Uh, the plan for this webinar is we, it, it will last about, about an hour to 60 minutes or so. Half of the time will be spent with a presentation by our colleagues here, our panelists, and then we're gonna try and, and and give you a good amount of time for questions and answers. We definitely encourage you to please submit your questions. Uh, you can do so using the Q&A feature. You'll see that at the bottom of your screen on the platform, you'll see the q and uh, Please do enter your questions there. And if you don't mind, please just let us know who you are you're and where you're from. That's always nice to see. Um, I realize there's also a, a chat feature using platforms, but we'll try and use that for other forms of other communications. So please do look in the Q&A section for questions that are being asked and, and feel free to ask your own there too. We're gonna post a recording of this webinar on our website at earthjournalism.net, so you can certainly check it out afterwards and feel free to share it. Uh, we certainly encourage that. Uh, and finally, just to mention that we have a bunch of upcoming webinars on related topics over the coming uh, days and weeks. Tomorrow, there's going to be a webinar uh, sponsored by our colleagues at the East Africa uh, Wildlife and Conservation Project. So that will be a webinar on, on the wildlife trade in East Africa. You're, you're welcome to join that. Um, that will take place at 3 p.m. Nairobi time. Uh, next week, oh, and in the following weeks, we'll have further webinars looking at how to report on the wildlife trade, how to do investigative reporting, how to do data journalism regarding the wildlife trade, um, and a lot of those will be focused in Asia and the Pacific region. Uh, we'll have journalists from China, Vietnam, and the Philippines as speaking about how they go about their work. And again, you can find all this information on our website at earthjournalism.net. But without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists. I'm not gonna introduce all of them. I'll just turn it over to our moderator, David Bolking. He's with the One Health Institute at uh, the University of California, Davis. 
and he's going to introduce the rest of his panelists. And thank you again, ladies and gentlemen, for, for joining us. I'll turn it over to you, David. Yeah, thank you, James. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. We were really excited to, to be with you all and to you know, hopefully give you a, a nice tour of some of the work we've been doing with the USA Predict project. We're not going to get too much into the preamp project today, but it's um, largely a, you know, a lot of us working on, on similar efforts. So James Mangura and Sierra Leone and I work on, on preamp together. But uh, we wanted to, to focus on Predict, I think, um, today predominantly because it has a larger geographic footprint. Um, so Predict is a, you know, a pretty big program um, you know, working in over 35 countries over the past uh, decade. Uh, and is winding down, so we're in our last six months of, of the project right now. So we're gonna, I'm gonna share some slides. And as I hand it over to each speaker, I'll do a, a brief introduction of, of the rest of the panel. But um, just to get us started today, let me get these up. Okay, so we're gonna get into, you know, how the PREDICT project in particular works uh, around the world to, you know, put, build capacity and, and really strengthen capabilities to detect and, and prevent viruses from, from emerging. And how do we do that? Where do we work? So we, we tend to work in hotspots for virus emergence and we, we sort of start with the math and Dr. Pranav Panda is gonna speak a little bit more about uh, using math and the data and, and modeling tools and, and techniques to really inform decision-making and help us, you know, guide surveillance and disease detection efforts. But we, we, we work with PREDICT, we, we started with some models that, that showed us where some of the hotspots for emerging viruses really were um, around the world. And a lot of these were in low and middle income countries. And as a project funded by the US Agency for International Development, you know, we worked with a lot of these country partners to you know, identify areas in countries, you know, in Latin America, Africa, South and Southeast Asia, that, were, you know, that had a lot of what we consider drivers of, of disease emergence. So areas where there's high levels of biodiversity, um, population density, and a lot of landscape change. So things that come together almost in a perfect storm to you know, allow or enable uh, a virus or a disease to spill over from wildlife into human or domestic animal populations and then eventually spread. So in how we work, you know, we work in partnerships with local governments and scientists and universities around the world. And um, Dr. Grace Mongoka will tell you a little bit about how this works in, in Tanzania in a little bit. But our approach was to, to use One Health. And that's sort of an idea that the well-being of humans is inextricably linked to the health of the planet. And recognizing that, you know, the health of humans and wildlife and animals and ecosystems are, are linked and to, to really understand sort of these challenges and address these big challenges like, you know, virus spillover or pandemic um, threats, you really need to build big teams, multidisciplinary teams, teams of experts. And I think the, the panel today is a, a pretty good, you know, mix of, of individuals um, with diverse expertise. Um, Grace is a veterinarian. James is a public health expert. Pranav is a, you know, a bioinformatician and a mathematician. And, and so bringing us all together on, on, on teams to work on these problems is really the, how the PREDICT team kind of built um, a really interesting platform and network that allowed us to do some great work. So this is just a, a really quick concept slide to show you how we put so, you know, our work in action in some of these areas. And using this One Health concept, uh, we, we used One Health to, to create sort of a surveillance design uh, that you know, would take our multidisciplinary teams and go out into these hotspots for virus emergence um, <clears throat> and really target some key interfaces. So interfaces are, are basically areas where, you know, we've identified, you know, high risk for um, contact with, you know, wild animal populations or, you know, um, basically the, the, the ingredients to create a viral spillover, um, you know, recipe. And we would go out into these communities and work with community members to really understand what were the human behaviors and what were the factors that, that could be, you know, linked to a virus spillover event. And then with their permission, we would go out and, and collect samples humanely and safely from wildlife populations and partner with health centers and clinics and hospitals and even, you know, in the community themselves to, to collect samples from people. Um, we would take, you know, the, our, our team. So this is a sort of a, a photo from, of this One Health work in action. This is a team in Nepal um, working at one of these, you know, high risk interfaces that we, we identified in an urban area uh, of Kathmandu where there's a lot of informal settlements. So just, 
you know, uh, settlements of people sort of growing up in a rapidly expanding city with a lot of human population movement. And, you know, the dominant wildlife species uh, in these areas was often, you know, rodents and, and bats living in and around people's homes and, you know, also non-human primates like uh, rhesus macaques that are uh, pretty prevalent in, in that area. And so our teams would, you know, get into their protective gear, um, you know, to prevent you know, themselves getting infected in the field and safely capture, um, you know, wildlife and collect samples and then release the animals back into the wild. So a lot of our, our you know, predict work is very conservation focused. Um, so we believe very strongly in, in protecting and working safely with wild animal populations. And that same team in Nepal uh, and everywhere else we worked in predict would partner with local health centers and community members to understand their risks and their health um, concerns and collect samples from the human community as well. And what do we do with all of those samples? Well, we, we worked also with laboratory networks in each country uh, and we created a, a disease detection platform that had the capability to screen samples at the viral family level, which lets us cast a, a wider net. So instead of testing for a specific virus, you know, like an Ebola virus or, you know, SARS coronavirus 2, for example, we would test for filoviruses, the family that Ebola belongs to, or coronaviruses, the broader family that, you know, SARS 2 is, is a part of. Uh, and that lets us, you know, gives us the capability to detect, you know, not, not just these known pathogens and known zoonotic diseases, but also the potential new emerging threats um, that might be circulating in these, in these wildlife populations or even in the human communities themselves. So we, we worked with laboratories around the world in over 35 countries, more than 60 labs so far, to build that molecular virology capacity for virus detection. And then also, you know, help sort of train and, and equip the laboratory workforce um, to do this work, you know, independently in their labs and, and also work to really create a sort of a One Health laboratory network where we try to twin the veterinary and public health laboratory systems together for information sharing and, and connect them to a, you know, a big global network of, of disease detection experts. So there is always, you know, the capability for mentorship and information sharing and really sort of strengthen the, you know, the, the entire system that way. We also, um, launched some behavioral risk investigations. So partnering with social scientists and behavioral scientists, we put in place some epidemiological and behavioral scientific research methodologies to really understand, you know, in these human communities, what are the factors um, that, you know, could be linked to a virus spillover um, event or causing viral transmission between animals and people. And this work really allowed us to do some deep dives into particularly at-risk interfaces. Um, interfaces like the Bushmead value chain in Central and East Africa, wildlife markets in South and Southeast Asia, the informal settlements I was talking about in, in Nepal and ecotourism and other at-risk interfaces like Bakwano farms and, and, and things like that. And I think Grace will probably get into some of those in Pranav as well in their presentations. And what do we do with all this data? Um, so once we, you know, have some virus findings, for example, in, in Sierra Leone, we detected a, a new Ebola virus called the Bomboli virus. And our teams detected that in bats. And James Bangura um, was, you know, leading that team. And they detected this, this virus in bats that lived in people's homes. And we needed to, to really rapidly put together a plan to, to share what that meant for these communities, you know, these Bats were, you know, in the communities, living in their homes. They, you know, harbored a, a new Ebola virus that had never yet detect, you know, caused disease in, in the human population that we were aware of. And so we worked with the government of Sierra Leone to uh, design this um, behavior change and risk communication strategy um, that we entitled Living Safely with Bats, which was a pictorial book. Uh, this is just one example of these communication tools, but a pictorial book that the team in Sierra Leone could take to the communities and talk about the risks of, of bats, but also the benefit of bats to ecosystems and ecosystem health. Uh, and so we've got, you know, resources like that now translated into lots of different languages and freely available online. And this slide showcases a few of the other tools that we put together, some in Swahili for the East Africa region and in French for West Africa. So over, you know, I'm gonna just give a quick snapshot of Predict's impact before I, I introduce the rest of the panel. But uh, over the last 10 years, you know, Predict has trained more than 6,800 people, collected samples from hundreds of thousands of, of animals and people, strengthened the, you know, the capacity for disease detection in more than 60 labs. And, and we've de detected and discovered, you know, a thousand plus viruses, as you can sort of see there. And, and what does this mean? I mean, this is, 
really what PREDICT was, was working to do was strengthen the capability of you know, some of the areas, some of the countries and the, the systems and the most vulnerable areas for disease emergence to be ready to you know, respond to a disease X, which um, this time around was COVID-19 and sort of a proof of concept. So it was a, a feasibility assessment to find viruses ahead of an outbreak. Um, we determined that emerging threats can be identified before spillover, um, for example, with the Bombolee virus in Sierra Leone. Uh, we also developed some financial projections to forecast, so how much would all of this cost, and you know, worked with some teams of, of economists to, to really understand the, the you know, cost benefit to you know, preventing a pandemic, to preventing outbreaks, to doing sort of this work up front. Um, we've identified and trained you know, qualified professionals and, and really built this One Health workforce, which is now standing ready to, to help out in, in any emergency situation. And even with COVID-19 is called into action and you know, working quite a bit. And we can talk about more of that in the, in the Q&A later. Um, we've you know, worked in over 60 laboratories and we've cataloged these high-risk viruses and the metadata, the metadata associated with them. So really trying to understand the risk for mitigation and, and what we can do about them. And I think Pranav's gonna give a really nice overview of that in, in his presentation. But perhaps most importantly, we, I think we demonstrated the importance to really work together cooperatively, globally, um, and in a multi-sectoral One Health way to, you know, on emerging infectious disease control and prevention. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Dr. Grace Mongoka, who I've been working with um, for the last six years and I've had the, the pleasure to partner with her in Tanzania. And she's gonna show you a little bit about how Predict Tanzania was put into action, how we put this One Health approach in, in action. So Grace, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, David, for a very nice summary. Well, in Tanzania, um, my name is Grace, like David said, and in the, uh, in, uh, during predict implementation in Tanzania, I was coding the human surveillance and part of the behavioral risk assessment. So in Tanzania, we had to implement a predict in one health, putting one health in action that uh, our institution, which is a, a primarily dealing with the uh, human health, we had to coordinate with the Sukonya University. Really dealing with it. The next slide, David. No. Next slide. So in Tanzania, we had a community surveillance, and uh, this was primarily um, being done in the northern west part of Tanzania. And this site was selected based on they are located at the border, uh, bordering Uganda, uh, Congo, uh, and Burundi, and Rwanda. And most of the time, there's uh, um, uncontrolled movements of people in some of the areas they have. Uh, in one of the, the sites, we have the uh, larger refugees camp. So there is a quite a big interaction of the community themselves and the people around that area. So we had uh, concurrently sampled the human and the, the wildlife in close proximity, just making sure that we capture any viral transmission what can happen within a species, but if they can happen, uh, they can spill over to human. So we had one component on the uh, clinics. So we partly we, we collected samples from the human uh, at the health facilities, but also we collected samples from the community. We are assuming that most of the time when people are sick, uh, they, they don't go to the hospital or they self-medicate. So to get those that they don't go to the hospital, we had to uh, collect the samples from the community. And these, uh, the, these communities uh, we selected based on their livelihood. Uh, most of them, they are, we, we feel that they are more at risk of getting the infection. But in parallel to that, we had the, uh, the questionnaire, uh, which we have the, um, the, like the survey, but we also focus group discussion, where we have differently asking people about their awareness, but again, if there's any uh, biosecurity measures that have been implemented to prevent uh, getting them infection from their uh, animals, being livestock or wildlife, and some of them um, 
also the disease transmission and zoonotic diseases in their community. And the, this surveillance took place uh, during the wet season and dry season. It was important to make sure that um, between the, the two seasons. So from the co community and even the health uh, clinic, the biggest challenge was to make sure we get a viable sample. So we had to most of the time travel like more than a thousand kilometers to refill, especially for health clinic with the liquid nitrogen and supplies uh, uh, for all the, in, uh, because we are working with the healthcare workers um, and get a lot of support from the from the from the government too. Next slide. Next slide. So from the community, we had to transfer all the samples to the lab. Like David mentioned, that building capacity uh, to the, our laboratory was very, very critical. And like now we see the potential of what Patrick did, uh, making sure that uh, our, the local our laboratory have the capacity to detect viruses. Uh, so for the predict, we had the uh, opportunity to get a mentorship of a senior laboratory scientist from UC Davis. Uh, Brett, you came to mentor uh, the two uh, laboratory, and they had an opportunity to test five uh, viral families. This uh, we call the big five, which have the potential of causing pand pandemic. And now we have the COVID-19 is uh, within the coronaviruses, but the capacity has to expand. So our two, the two team from the SU and the IHI has to transfer the skills and knowledge that they have to more uh, local people, meaning the, the intern, uh, the student, even the government uh, laboratory staff. The picture on the, on the right, you can see we had the workshop where the government staff we had to come to attach to our lab at least for two weeks to get a hand on experience on testing these viruses. So we had to, to make sure that the, this, uh, the staff from the, the human lab, the wildlife and uh, livestock come together and also to discuss some of the challenges that they found out uh, in, the, when, in their working places, how they can share the information, the protocols, and to improve their knowledge too. Next. Next slide. So from the community, uh, from the laboratory, we had to go to the community uh, where we had to really uh, inform them about what we found out. We had the community engagement from the beginning. We had through the community meetings, but during the sampling, we continue with the discussion uh, during the, the survey. But from this, uh, the, the result from the predicts was very eye-opening um, where we confirmed that but really uh, the host of many pandemic uh, viruses, including Ebola, SARS, and MERS. So using the, the same um, bat book, which is developed by our colleagues at the predict uh, team, we had to translate it on Swahili because uh, during the, uh, the surveillance, we had experienced more of um, uh, people had in contact with these uh, bats, especially in their households, but some of them, they, they are eating uh, the bats, some of them even fresh. Um, they are harvesting uh, bat, uh, bat guano for uh, fertilizers. So we had to, when we got these findings, we had to go back and try to educate them. Of course, the community was very engage, engaging and uh, some of them, they are offering some local um, method that they've been using to uh, get rid of the bats from their households. But some of them, they've changed the behavior, meaning they, they have uh, stopped eating the bats. So, but, uh, the challenge is human behavior, is a, changing human behavior is a process. So we had some of the material that we have to leave behind to stick them in uh, maybe in the market, in different hospitals or uh, house facilities for them to continue uh, looking at them and observe. And I'm sure by now they remember what we told them uh, about the risk of this getting infection from these animals. So we had uh, a chance of getting not a very large number of people, the, the community leaders, and their representative, the, the key stakeholders from the local governments, but even individual communities also attended in this, um, in this meeting where we involved them. Thank you. Maybe I'll, I'll talk more during the question and answer. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Grace. I think it'll be great to hear some questions from the audience later on about the work in Tanzania. But now let's uh, turn it over to Dr. Pranav Pandit, who's uh, a really great mathematician who's been working a lot on integrating um, data from both predict, but also open data sets around the world and trying to really use some of, you know, the, the modern data science tools to help inform how we do surveillance, how we identify these hotspots, and, and also, you know, how we use that information strategically to move towards prevention and, and towards, you know, identification of intervention strategies and even countermeasures. So Pranav, welcome and thanks for joining today. Yeah, thank you for having me and thanks David for the introduction. Uh, you, just, uh, you just heard from Dr. Grace about how PREDICT is working uh, in Tanzania. So I think now it's a great time to move uh, and go, uh, look the project from slightly a global perspective. And uh, within this presentation, I'll try, to, uh, I'll try to explain how the vast data of the PREDICT project has been collecting for last uh, almost 10 years. Uh, we are using that to identify and develop models that can help us, uh, help us determine policies so that uh, we can uh, mitigate risk related to emerging pandemic threats. Uh, especially from viruses. So if you go to our next slide. Before, before we go into any specific models, I just want to reiterate uh, the predict surveillance strategy. As uh, Dr. Grace and David has already mentioned, it's a risk-based risk surveillance strategy. What it means is that we have been targeting uh, animal taxa that are known to live very close in a very close association with humans which include bats non-human primates uh, rodents and uh, different birds of course domestic animals and some other wildlife taxa that are known to stay along with people and with we are we are also uh, we are also uh, trying to identify viruses in key viral families which include coronaviruses paramyxoviruses filoviruses and flaviviruses all of these are known to uh, cause uh, diseases of public health importance, and um, of which, as you know, uh, coronaviruses is right now one of the, uh, one of the uh, viral families of uh, great, uh, great concern. But uh, other viral families, including flavor viruses, caused, uh, caused significant public health outbreaks about four years ago. Filoviruses, which includes Ebola viruses, are also known to cause uh, outbreaks in, uh, in humans. And uh, here you can see uh, just the timeline of our surveillance efforts. And over the last 10 years, we have sampled more than 100,000 individual animal, animals from wildlife, as well as about 30,000 people. And we tried to detect these viruses from these five viral families. And we have, uh, until now, we have uh, detected almost more than 900 uh, new, uh, completely new viruses uh, during this uh, during this surveillance, and it's just not the data about new viruses, but all the metadata that ecological data associated with those animals and those viruses that we have been collecting, and we have been using uh, this data sets to uh, develop our models and uh, ascertain the risk related to these new viruses. So within this presentation, what I'll do is basically show you a few examples of the models that we have developed which first try to identify the key human animal interfaces that we think are important in disease transmission from wildlife to animals and how we use those uh, models to identify key species of wildlife so that we can, uh, we can develop studies related to those species and understand the ecology of those viruses in detail so that we can develop uh, policies uh, to mitigate threats from those specific species. So if we go to our next slide, We'll have our first example where we try to where we try to identify key animal human interfaces. Here in the plot, you can see that uh, uh, on on the vertical axis, there are species that have been classified according to IUCN threat and status, and the bubbles basically represent the number of, of viruses that those species groups of species share with humans. And as you can see the bigger bubbles uh, represents higher number of viruses. And you can see that uh, species that have been threatened due to uh, human exploitation, especially due to exploitation of their habitats and uh, just exploitation due to hunting, tend to have higher number of twice as many viruses uh, uh, than other species. So what it means is that it indicates us that these are the key 
animal human interfaces, which includes uh, live uh, wildlife markets, bat caves, that, that needs to be protected. And that's where the transmission from uh, wild, wild animals to humans tend to occur. So this is, uh, this is a recent study that we published in uh, Proceedings of Royal Society B that is talking about our new results here that identify key human animal interfaces. So the next example I'll give is about flavor viruses. If we move to the next slide. So quick introduction about flavor viruses. Uh, if, if you remember uh, about four years ago during the last uh, uh, Olympic year, there was a big outbreak of Zika virus that happened in Brazil. And Zika virus is a part of a, a bigger viral family called as flavor viruses. And it also includes other flavor viruses such as yellow fever virus, dengue, uh, West, Nile, uh, West Nile virus. All of these are viruses of uh, public health importance and they are uh, spread globally. They are everywhere on all the continents. And we wanted to see what are the key wildlife species that we should, uh, we should target so that we can uh, develop the surveillance around these uh, flavor viruses. And hence, we, hence this uh, model development happened. So, all of these models, how they work is that we try to look into known, uh, known hosts or known knowledge about these viruses and use, learn from that uh, knowledge and infer upon uh, the emerging viruses from those viral families. So what we basically did was we looked into the data and, and saw what are the species, what are the bird species, what are the primate species, what are the bat species that these uh, viruses are known to infect. And here in the dendrogram, in the clustering figure, you can see that, uh, that some viruses tend to infect similar type of hosts. So like, for example, next to the primate icon, you can see that uh, Zika and yellow fever tend to infect primates. There are some, uh, some viral species that tend to just inf infect bats. But then there are some viral species that tend to infect wide variety of animals, including birds, horses, and humans, of course. I mean, all of these are zoonotic viruses that tend to infect humans. So what we do is basically we develop models that learn from this data and try to predict where, what could be the missing uh, hosts of these uh, flavor viruses. And here you can just see in the uh, maps below is the distribution of predicted hosts of, for these flavor viruses. The first plot basically shows the distribution of yellow fever and Zika host, the red, more the red area, the higher diversity of predicted host. Similarly, the middle plot shows uh, the distribution of uh, dengue host, predicted dengue virus host. And then the last plot shows the distribution of Japanese encephal encephalitis host. So this is, how, uh, this is how these models are helping us not just identify species, but identify regions where we should go out and do more sampling and do more studies. If we go to the next slide. So now we have seen uh, how these models are inferring upon uh, known viruses, known emerging uh, viruses. But what about predict viruses? Can these models help us uh, tell anything about newly identified predict viruses? And the answer is yes. So the way we are handling this issue is we're trying to understand the community of viruses and their wildlife hosts. So if we just look at the uh, network on the left side, basically each, each dot in the network represents a virus. And, when, uh, and those two viruses are connected to each other when they share a, share a wildlife host. What it means is that both, both those viruses are found in the same host. So, on the left side is a network that is generated based on the knowledge of all the viruses in wildlife. That's how the structure of their sharing a host looks like. And when we develop those models based on these networks and we add our novel viruses that we have uh, discovered in PREDICT during the last 10 years, you can see that these PREDICT viruses represented by white dots in the right figure basically lie where do they lie in the network and what is their position in the host, host network of this virus host community. And this, this representation of the network helps us identify what are the new predict viruses that can infect wide variety of species. What are the uh, 
what are the new predict viruses that can just infect some type of species. They are very well specialized to certain types of species, while uh, some might be just found in only one, uh, one species and they are very super specialized to only one species. So these network models are helping us develop uh, further uh, about the ecology of these newly discovered viruses. If you go to the next slide, so why why are we why are we do, developing these models? Is first of all we uh, this is to develop a targeted wildlife surveillance for emerging infectious diseases. As we have been uh, listening about from David and Grace, that uh, we go out and we try to identify hotspots where uh, where the transmission from wildlife to human can occur, but to identify those hotspots, these models are very essential. For example, just take an example of Zika virus. Before the modeling work, we just knew uh, about few species that could infect Zika and yellow fever, let's say about 14. But now we have a list of about 112 species that potentially could harbor Zika virus. And probably we should go out there in wildlife and sample all these species. And not just the, the the list of species, but what type of animal taxa we need to target is also uh, informed from these models. And as we saw in the maps, we also know where these species tend to exist. So we can also identify geographical hotspots. If you go to the last slide. So I want to, uh, in this last slide, I just want to uh, it, uh, mention here that uh, the whole modeling is an iterative process. So we develop models based on the available data that we have and use uh, the inferences from the model to do further field work. The field work basically then generates new data, which eventually again helps us improve our models. And within this circle, within this iterative process, every time there is a policy decision that needs to be made, these models are helping us uh, develop those uh, policy decisions so that we can mitigate the risk better. So uh, eventually, since it's a, it's a very iterative process which requires multiple, uh, multiple um, expertise, it, it's, a, it's a big teamwork. And here is just a photo of uh, the whole predict team uh, all together with all their different expertise working together to develop uh, this project. So with this, I think I hand it over back to David. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Pranav. You know, I, I think we're sort of at a point with the PREDICT project now where we're, you know, using a lot of the data we've collected over the past decade to, you know, work through it, analyze it, interpret it, and, and really come to some, you know, key insights on, you know, what it means for, you know, predicting viral spillover risk and what we can do in terms of strategies for interventions and prevention. But I, we wanted to, James to talk a little bit about today, James Mangura, what happens, you know, when you don't get there preemptively when when you you know after a virus spillover event happens and, and james has had a lot of experience in sierra leone working um in outbreak situations he was part of the team um working on response during the west african ebola epidemic in in sierra leone and he's now working in the situation room and with the outbreak task force in sierra leone on covid 19 response support um and so we just wanted to you know have give james the opportunity to talk about that side of the story as well. I mean, predict is, you know, we our, our primary mandate has always been to, you know, work um, upstream of any virus spillover and spread event. So before an outbreak and really understand the threats, pre-emergence, so to speak. But um, because of our capability and our One Health approach and our teams, we also have a, you know, a range of experience working and supporting our host country governments with outbreak response and with technical assistance. And that's something that, that James does excellently. So James, over to you, please. Thank you, David. Um, thank you very much. I um, mean, Sierra Leone, what we are doing, we have moved um, from the routine activities that we, we, we've been implementing to reacting to the spillover now. We, we have worked with the government uh, for the past four years um, on preventing or working hard to detect spillovers. Now we have spillover. Um, when when the, um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic started, we, we change our, our services, our programs to supporting the government to prepare 
and putting systems in place to detect any spillover or any importation of the virus um, into the country. We moved from, um, from preventing to detect now to responding now, building capacity to cope with um, what we are experiencing now um, from working with the national government onto district uh, that is sub subnational government to prepare systems, build teams to respond adequately um, to the, the pandemic. Yes. Next slide. Next slide, please. So um, at the time of um, the preparation of these, uh, not the, the previous slide, please. Thank you, that's the one. At the time of the preparation of the slides, uh, we at this point, the country had reported, um, had had cases, um, swallowed cases in, in four of the, the 16 districts that we have. Mostly um, the cases are coming from the city, the capital city, which is Freetown. And of those cases, we, we've seen um, over 39% of these cases are occurring um, among healthcare workers within um, Sierra Leone. And the system that we are working and supporting, we moved from the surveillance to look for the virus in animals to now building systems to implement a system to detect the, the virus from into humans, like estimating who and who is in, in exposed uh, within the communities. So primarily we are using an event-based surveillance system, which was built um, it's a, we, from the 2014 Ebola outbreak. There is a toll-free line, which is the 117 line, which is populated um, with um, well, well advertised across the country the people who, whatever event of travelers into the country or unusual occurrences across the country or individuals that are sick, could be your relative or could be at the health facilities. Everyone is encouraged to, to call on 117, it's a toll free one, to notify the event. So the event, the system is built on when those alerts are, are, are sent in, the 117 has a 247 um, staff that, that logs in these alerts autom automatically and then they push them into the surveillance um, t system for case investigators to do the investigation. Next slide, David. Before, before we, we had the first case, we, we worked on with the, with the national government to put system in place. How would we uh, pick up the first importation? So the, the photo you see in the early days before we had any first case here in the country, working with the districts, um, the man with the black shirt there that sat down is the, is the district medical mm -hmm. officer for one of the border districts, having systems in place to having meetings with the border district, uh, putting systems to pick up any importation, uh, even before Guinea had, and then before Liberia, our neighbors had any cases, these structures have been in place to to guide them what we need to do and what event that needs to be investigated, um, what constitutes an alert that needs um, investigation. And then all of those were built upon the two approach um, that helped us to, to, to pick up the cases that we are having now. The verification of all the alerts that I mentioned earlier that are coming through the 117 system. We work with the government to be sure that we have individuals at health facilities that will investigate uh, alert individuals that work, either they walks in or individual that were um, that are a lot are sent by the contact tracers in the various communities across the country uh, wherever contact we have those people who we have we have trained to make sure they, they have conduct comprehensive investigation of those alert. we also have a second approach that we're using is finding the cases apart from the the events that have been reported on to us camp we work on building teams with the government um, together with other technical partners, the WHO, the CDC and MSF. We work together training personnel and then healthcare workers, uh, medical students, uh, medical graduates to go into these communities like identified hotspots where um, cases are coming from now to um, and, and investigate individuals that could be at risk. 
you know, we establish sentinel surveillance at high risk. Those communities we have identified pharmacies, um, healthcare, I mean, attendance has gone down, like clinic attendance has gone down. But we, we have built a system wherein those that walk in into the clinics can be investigated, and as well as also going in retrospect, reviewing red clinic registers for individuals that have been, that have come and then presenting um, I mean, flu-like illness that are mimicking to um, COVID-19, and then those are all being investigated through the Sentinel system, and as well as the pharmacies as well. Uh, many people will just walk um, to a pharmacy and then uh, and then get over the counter medication, which is now very well restricted here, and then they get um, a medication. Those are individuals. We have a mm -hmm. building system with the government to make sure with the pharmacies and then the, uh, the structure that the government have to make sure that those individuals are uh, alerts are triggered so we can investigate those. And then um, in the high volume facilities, again, in the communities where we are having cases, we've also worked with the government to put system in place to be sure that when these individuals are, are being seen, we can also prospectively um, in, um, investigate them to see what they have um, over the period um, again to this moment. Next slide. There. So the way the, the system works, the, the event-based system, it has a flow. So these alerts are triggered um, by either the community members or from the health facility, or it could be a friend, or it could be um, individuals who trigger this. They are generated um, at, the, at the 117 system. We have various teams that we have worked with the government together with other partners, the WHO, the CDC, um, to train individuals we call case investigators. These are, uh, are people with health background, could be some most are nurses, some are uh, medical graduates, um, house officers, and then some are medical students in the final year of medical school, with whom we have trained as um, case investigators to investigate all of these alerts to be sure that these alerts meet the case definition. Once they are given this alert, they move to the various location where the alert comes in from, and then they investigate. Once the individual meets the criteria that, will, um, that, 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 that we look for to suspect a, a COVID case, and then the lab team is notified here. Um, the lab team goes in, collects sample, and the individuals are isolated. We've also had um, situations wherein we train these individuals to be able to identify some, some of the lots of primes, and then some are also related to non-COVID. So also looking through we refer to them as false alerts related to, not related to COVID, but if they have got their known COVID illnesses also, building a system wherein they can be cared for outside the COVID response structure that, that we have. This is the, the main structure that, that fits in and then that um, facilitates the, rest, the, the, the surveillance for the, within the country right now. It's like a surveillance system we move from surveillance system in animals, and now the surveillance system in humans for specific events related to COVID. And that's the flow on how the system works here in country. And this has been um, very successful thus far um, in helping us pick up the cases that we have. Next slide, please. Next slide, David. At the moment, uh, we, in the country, we are having clusters of cases. So within these clusters of cases involve um, engagement. We work with uh, the military, you see the photos, and then also work with communities, engaging them to carry out comprehensive investigation of every case. We are at the point we, where we have the first few cases. And uh, within us, um, as a program, UC Davis and WHO, um, CDC, we sit together with the technical partners at the technical meetings every day. We look through case, case by case that we are having. We still have the opportunity in country and then look through what needs to be done. And then after focus is mainly identifying, trying to connect the transmission, identifying how is this, how did this individual got exposed. And then a lot of um, intervention, a lot of steps are involved in this, engaging communities, um, talking to community members, talking to maybe pharmacies, whether they could recall on what has been happening over time before we had a system in. And then also, um, of course, be walking through these high volume facilities. And then at times again, you see on the second photo below, you see meeting with community leaders to talk through, this is what we look for. And then to give us the stories we are interested in, 
understanding what is happening in those communities. And then that has helped us to identify sick people that could be in the community. So individuals say, oh, I know of someone in that particular location who was not keeping well and then feels like, um, looks like what you are explaining is what this person uh, was sick of. And then that's how we find in these cases uh, within the communities. And as well as also the stories um, on how this individual came and then um, following up all of the steps, uh, triangulating information from one phase to the other, or from one um, sub-national to how the individual came national, or from the, the community onto a sub-national facility, which uh, we have our, our representatives there. So that is what we are doing at the moment. And then following up every single, we are not, we are not letting go any rumors at all. So we, we take every rumor very serious, and then it's being investigated comprehensively, and then usually it does take time and then resources like uh, the, the personnel that's needed to do that. So we have so job, work with government, so job a lot of uh, the human uh, uh, resource to, to be able to cope with the alerts that are coming in, the alert volumes that are coming in over the last, uh, the last three weeks since we had the first case. Next slide, please. So uh, basically for us um, as a country, that's what we have been doing and uh, as a program and then as a, a university, we will continue to work with the, with the government, putting in place, revisiting um, the surveillance systems that we have um, that is in place or what is needed over time and then try providing roadmap on step by step, what needs to be done at every point of the outbreak here in, in country and we also looking through uh, contact tracing system, what are the feasible around the uh, quarantining facilities, what are what necessary to be done over time. So that's exactly uh, what we're doing here in response to the spillover when you're unable to really prevent it. I hand over to David, please. Yeah, thanks, James. We're, we're running short on time, so I know we, we want to get into the question session. Um, and we'll just leave this this roadmap slide there as, you know, a few points that the predict team has sort of put together on, you know, what we believe to be a, you know, at, at least a, a basic but an effective roadmap for pandemic prevention. But uh, James, over to you to, to lead the Q&A. Thanks everyone for those uh, presentations. So yeah, just a reminder, you can ask your questions on the Q&A feature and some of them are being answered on that feature as well by the panelists so they're able some cases to respond directly. Um, our most popular question is from Mungelo Ndlovu from Zimbabwe. How can journalists constructively communicate the urgency and severity of pandemics without contributing to panic or fear of viruses? It's a great question. Um, I think James, you know, honestly, you, you all are the journalism experts. I, I would almost defer that to your expertise. Um, I mean, certainly we can we can top up on on the technical side, but you know maybe you know working together with you know experts to identify real, true, factual based sources of information. But I mean, presenting that information and communicating, I think you know falls in your wheelhouse more than ours. <laughs> it's okay, you turn it back on me. Um, yeah, I mean, just uh, this is something that we try and advise journalists about at Earth Journalism Network. So please check out our website. We just uh, posted a whole tip sheet on, on how to communicate, uh, you know, uh, about uh, zoonotic diseases. Uh, certainly you want, as journalists, you want to uh, connect with scientists like the panelists we have here. Look for local scientists that you can talk to regularly, get their advice, and especially talk to medical experts to make sure that you're giving good tips on on how to react to the pandemic without, you know, without panicking. So I do urge you to check out some of the materials on our website. Let me, while we have the panelists here, let me ask some more questions for them. Uh, we have a question from Ralph Mwenningwe. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, but David and friends, could, could the coronavirus that is causing COVID-19 have been detected earlier? And Mona Samari adds, are, are you guys surprised by its far reaching spread? Is there anything that could have been done uh, ahead of time to kind of maybe help pre prevent that from happening? Yeah, those are great questions. Pranav, do you wanna to speak to that from a, a, a data perspective? 
Right. I think uh, we like within the epidemiology field, I think people are not really surprised with this, how far the coronavirus has reached uh, globally. Uh, if we just look at the uh, SARS-1 or the MERS outbreaks, uh, which happened like in 2002 and 2013, I think uh, they were contained really quickly just because uh, at that time, even if we just look at the uh, avian transportation from China globally, it has now probably increased tenfold, fifteenfold uh, within the last ten years. So the way the virus this time spread really quickly globally was probably because of that. And uh, of course, there are some other epidemiological reasons, reasons as well that we couldn't quickly contain the virus. But uh, it was like within the epidemiology uh, realm, people were scared of something like this happening, for sure. Um, so did did we did we need to be checking, for instance, in wildlife markets in Asia, for instance, which you identified as a potentially at risk interface, and uh, is that being done uh, either by your team or by somebody else? Yeah, great question. Uh, uh, there's a, a lot of research groups doing doing work in in the wildlife markets in and around the world. I mean, in, in these wet markets, these wildlife markets are not unique to Asia. Um, you know, they're also pretty prevalent in, in West, Central, East Africa, and, and beyond uh, as well. And you know, PREDICT did do work in these markets, and we collected samples in these markets, and we worked to understand the, the, the value chain, you know, from, you know, the, the source animal and, you know, its natural habitat through the trade system and the network into the market itself. Um, a lot of research groups, you know, around the world have, have focused in on that, and that just predicted um, as an, an obvious at-risk interface. And, and it's something that you know requires ongoing monitoring. So I, mean, I think everyone needs to understand that, that viruses evolve um, and things change, and it's not a, a static um, landscape. It's a very dynamic process. The process of a virus spillover and spread, and the risks of that. Uh, and so continued and ongoing monitoring is required for something like you know COVID nineteen. Uh, a lot of work was done in in the caves in and around that area of China. Um, after SARS, you know, to monitor, you know, those bats, but the risks um, were still there and, and the, the human animal contact with, you know, bats in those caves, which are the, you know, the suspected host uh, reservoir species for that spillover event are, you know, are, are, are still, you know, part of the human fabric and part of something that, you know, we, we need to actively address. Basically the relationship of, of how humans are interacting with with wildlife and and the impact and the footprint of of you know our species on the planet and ecosystems and and how that's you know responsible and causing some of these these events um, it's kind of a a good message for Earth Day you know we we really need to work as we presented earlier on on how to live safely with wildlife and how to live safely and 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 together and protect habitats and work you know with conservation groups and work with health experts and work with communities to really address some of the drivers of, of, of these things. So you mentioned some of the drivers we talked about wildlife markets and other questions we've had from Tracy Keeling and others uh, are is how much is climate change a factor in driving these epidemics and, and as well as in encroachment on natural spaces? I think I think climate change is definitely playing an important role. Uh, just if you look at the example of flaviviruses, uh, these are all the viruses that are transmitted by vectors, so mosquitoes and ticks, which are heavily uh, regulated. Their populations are heavily regulated by temperature and other climatic variables. So there is a fear that uh, these vectors will be more prevalent in temperate regions uh, because of the warming, global warming. and uh, this help this uh, spread of uh, viruses into regions where the populations are uh, populations are uh, still naive to these infections. So uh, it's uh, definitely playing an, an important role when uh, when we are looking into the spread of viruses across the globe. Great, thank you. We've got a bunch of questions that deal with human vulnerability to specific virus. Uh, uh, we have questions uh, from Parth Bandi Vadikar uh, about uh, have we, can we identified beforehand the types of genes which are vulnerable to mutations leading to 
spillover infection into into humans. Um, and you know, uh, is is it is it possible to determine you know uh, which viruses we might be immune to, which viruses in the wild we might be immune to, and which really present more of a threat? Right. I think that's that's a, another great question. Like this is what uh, once we have uh, discovered a new virus, this is what our lab teams are doing. Once we have isolated a new species, like for example, now we have identified the new Bambali virus, and uh, the lab team is trying to understand what are the uh, specific genes that uh, that help the virus have entry into bat cells compared to human cells. And what are the proteins uh, due to those genes which help them infect better humans versus uh, infect better bats? So these are all the studies that needs to be done for different viruses with uh, different uh, uh, strategies to identify those key genes that are helping mutations. Um, we have a question from Emma Gatton. Uh, what do you think are the potentially overlooked risk areas for spillovers? Or is there, are there any areas, we haven't talked a lot, for instance, about livestock and factory farms, so I'm wondering how much you look at that. Are there any other ri at-risk interfaces that we should be aware of? Uh, definitely livestock, uh, industrial livestock farming is one of the important source for zoonotic uh, diseases for humans. Uh, it's, uh, I think, eight or ten folds higher than wildlife for sure. But, uh, and, and, and to, to mitigate that, like improving biosafety is essential, uh, improving uh, the contact with wildlife uh, and uh, the contact interface between livestock and wildlife is also important. So uh, uh, those interfaces are very well studied, not just by our group, but by many other, many other people across the world. Um, I heard you, Pranav, you said, mentioned that you, you guys had detected over 900 new viruses along with the metadata about them. I mean, that's a lot of viruses. Uh, how do you determine, several people have asked, how do you determine which, which are really the ones that are most threatening? Right, that's, that's a great question. I mean, that's, uh, that's why we have like a whole team of modeling and analytics. And as I was trying to show that we try to look at uh, viruses that we know already are zoonotic and compare them with viruses that are not zoonotic or at least are yet to be uh, spill over to, uh, yet to spill over into humans. And then we try to understand what are the factors within zoonotic viruses that are making them zoonotic. They could be either ecological factors, they could be virological factors uh, and and then try to interpret that uh, that result on the, uh, the new viruses that we have been uh, finding. So uh, definitely, as I was talking about the uh, studies related to new Bambali virus, which is a new Ebola virus that is yet to be found in humans, uh, the lab team is doing the whole suite of virological experiments to determine if, the, if this can uh, infect humans. So this is how we are trying to uh, assert and the risk first on the ecological foot footprint whether this can be a virus that can get in contact with humans so that it can spill over and then on the virological footprint where we try to understand what are the specific genes that can help it mutate into humans thank you pranav so at my time we're past the hour mark uh, i hope the panelists can stay with us for just a few more questions and also, again, reminder, look at the Q&A feature. There are questions being asked and answered on there. So hopefully we're addressing as many of your questions as we can. Uh, maybe this is a question for Dr. Grace, please. Um, you have this project about living safely with bats. I wonder you know, if you could provide some practical advice for people who do have to live with bats. Should we just completely avoid eating bats, uh, what do you do about the people who collect guano? Is there a safe way to do that? So for, for us, I think 
um, there always been interaction. There's always been, um, because this bus, sometimes they, cut, they roost in their houses. So uh, there is a different way how we can safely deal with them. You cannot get rid of them. So we have to look at the conservation uh, partly, but again, do we have to live safely? So one of the things that we tell people is that if the bats come into a house, there has a, a means and ways how to prevent, maybe to uh, clear all the, the very small holes that uh, the bats can enter your houses. So how to to um, uh, renovate our houses, to build our houses that's in such a way this bats cannot roost in our houses. But if there's a chance that it happens, and we have to clean up all the guano, but we have to use the protective gears. Uh, in such a way, we have to put in the, uh, the gloves and the mask. If there is no mask, even the clothes mask to prevent them. And if there's a bat died in some way, they have not to touch it directly. They not they shouldn't uh, feed the animals. They have to bury it or burn it completely. But again, if it's happened in some points, they get beaten with the bats. They need to get a, a, a rabbit. They have to clean the wounds uh, thoroughly with uh, water and the soap, but again, they have to go to the hospital and get uh, informed the healthcare workers that they've been beaten or scratched by the bats and um, uh, get the, the vaccine. We recommend the rabies vaccine, but because some of these bats also carry the rabies vaccine. Um, if it's not necessary really to use a, a bat guano, especially for, for in our case here in Tanzania, we have so many other animals, livestock animals, where we can uh, get the uh, 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 fertilized manure, it's not, uh, I wouldn't recommend people to use the bat guano because we, you have an alternative. Unless for some of the countries they don't have alternative, yes, they can use. So the, 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 the thing is um, we have to try to protect ourselves. We have to live with them, yes, but we have to make sure that we live safely with them because they are carrying a lot of viruses and we don't know at what time the, the, the virus will spill over because that's the thing we're still investigating at what particular time and with as it is going on with those um, and the colonies of bats once we get all the, the answers it's easy also to communicate more of this um, intervention measures Great, thank you. Um, uh, I wonder if you could talk um, about the the COVID nineteen outbreak and whether I mean, do you think uh, is there, was is there anything we can we do to help uh, build uh, immunity in advance to to future outbreaks, or is is that building this herd immunity, we've heard a lot about building herd immunity. Is there any way we can do that short of just, you know, letting letting the virus run through the human population or, or of course developing a vaccine? I think, uh, I think uh, people have been discussing and developing models to understand we just allow to develop the herd immunity. But uh, as we know that the virus is, uh, virus is quite fatal and uh, has significant health, health impacts on certain groups of people, uh, I think people are not yet uh, completely sure about this, uh, about this approach. So the best approach uh, eventually could be, uh, eventually could be to uh, develop vaccine and develop herd immunity through vaccine. So uh, at least to have immunity to uh, people who are uh, in the vulnerable group uh, for, for COVID-19. And especially when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, emerging, emerging viruses uh, to avoid, some, uh, avoid uh, what's really happening with COVID-19, uh, to avoid emergence of new viruses, we should probably think of uh, reducing contact with wildlife and animals uh, and uh, uh, target those specific uh, interfaces where there is quite a lot of uh, human-animal contact that's happening, which is giving viruses a lot of opportunity to jump into humans. Okay, and maybe just the last question, because we are running out of time. 
um, but we will try and and if it's okay with you guys, we'll, we'll post your your slides and presentation on our website so that people can see that. But just a last question for you. Um, there has been a lot of talk, and you've mentioned yourself, we need to better monitor our inter interaction with, with wild animals. And there's been a lot, and a lot of attention on these wildlife markets. Do you provide specific advice for how these markets should be regulated or, or monitored? Uh, or do you think they should be closed down altogether, or 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 uh, do you do you provide that kind of policy advice? I think that's a that's a great question. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll start, and other panelists can top up. But you know, I think the the, the market issue and regulating the market issue is a, it's a very complex issue. So that, I mean, there's a lot of social factors involved as well, and some equity considerations. Um, you know, often you know livelihoods um, are dependent on on you know, some of these activities. So, you know, those that are engaged in, you know, in the wildlife trade, uh, you know, that, that are actively part of these wildlife value chains that sort of end, at, you know, at the market level. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of factors to consider there, you know, culture, um, income, livelihoods, and, you know, beyond just the, the simple blanket, you know, we can shut down a market and, and stop the risk. Because, you know, I, I think we, we need to be aware that, you know, Regulating markets is great. Creating safer markets might be an option. Um, we, we do have some partners um, that have you know, spent a lot of time, especially in the Southeast Asia region, working uh, with their host country governments on policy uh, ideas and policy strategies around this for, for a long, long time, Wildlife Conservation Society in particular. Um, but it's, it's you know, not a, a simple context to, to work through. Um, and I think, you know, when you, when you bring in the complexity of, of all of the actors and all of, all of the factors involved, it's, it's hard to say that, you know, just regulating the market is going to stop the risk anyway. You know, there's, there's still the risk of, of contact with wildlife, you know, outside of the market, you know, and, and, you know, the risk of spillover maybe is, you know, potentially amplified by the market setting, but uh, it's not the, the sole risk. So it's, that's sort of why we've, we've kind of taken, at least as researchers, the, the more value chain approach to really understand, you know, the risk, you know, along the entire, you know, stream, um, you know, from the wild animal and its natural habitat and into the market setting where it's finally sold uh, or, you know, consumed or, or whatever. But, you know, great questions. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of active work trying to, to really understand what the, the best approach should be, especially now in the COVID-19 situation. Um, you know, I, I think we support regulating markets as, as a conservation-oriented group, um, but, but getting there and getting to a specific strategy that, that works and addresses all of those complexities, I think is, is a big challenge and something we, we need to keep working on. Yeah, I guess if you just close down markets, you risk driving them underground. Um, I know I said that was the last question. I actually have just one more, if you don't mind, is can you talk just a little bit about preempt project? That sounds quite intriguing, maybe just very briefly. I mean, how do we preempt, uh, or do you have any broad comments on how we might preempt or prevent these? Yeah, I mean, so we, we talked, you know, the, the predict approach has been more kind of classic public health prevention. Um, but the, the preempt program is, is, a, is a project that's working on technologies and tools, so uh, countermeasures, so things like, you know, vaccines and innovative um, ways to work around it. And, you know, the preempt in, in Sierra Leone is, um, James can, can top up on this, he's, he's a huge part of that team there, but they're targeting loss of virus. And, you know, the, the, whether or not we, we could potentially create a, a vaccine technology to um, address some of these deadly pathogens in their wildlife hosts in a, in a cost-effective way. Um, and so that, that team is, is sort of a, a different kind of consortium, but it's the James's team in Sierra Leone, which, which leads the in-country activities to understand the loss of virus ecology and doing all the sampling in the field and everything. And then a big team of, of uh, laboratories in Europe and in the United States and Australia that are, are working to you know, engineer um, some new vaccine tools that, that might be able to cost effectively be introduced into a rodent population and, and stop loss in the rodents um, before, you know, the, the virus spills over into people. So it's just one of the, you know, the, the new things on the table that we have these, you know, excellent technologies um, and, and tons of, of capability, and especially when you, when you bring all of these brilliant minds together in a, in a collaborative way uh, or in a One Health kind of approach type way, the way we've been doing. And, you know, I mean, the opportunities are, are, are boundless there to, to sort of address, you know, some of these challenges like the virus spillover. I think we just 
we need to continue working on them, working together and, and, you know, hopefully keep advocating for the resources to do so. James, anything you want to say on, on preempt in Sierra Leone? Yes, David. Um, what we, in addition to what you just said, um, we are building One Health teams, uh, both officials from the Ministry of Health and Agriculture, who, you know, Lassa fever in Sierra Leone is endemic, but also you have regions that doesn't have cases at all. But the reservoir uh, and the animal reservoir is found across the country, everywhere within the country. So what we are doing is sampling, um, trapping rodents within the houses and out of houses in those communities, um, collecting samples to see whether we could find um, the viruses in those uh, um, species that we, of rodents that we will catch. So we, and this is, uh, we wrote a year old now, uh, multiple seasons, and then with the dry season and the, rain, the wet season as well, um, seeing the animal abundance, and then also the, the virus um, uh, a positivity rate in the animals that we will catch and then try to see was is it is there any different because of the environmental different that's why we have more spillovers in one region compared to the other region so we're trying to answer questions or oh, is it that the, the virus strain in one region varies from the other region where we do not have uh, of frequent spillover or is it uh, behavioral practices in the region where we have frequent spillover of Lassa virus from the rodents it differ from the other regions where we do not have? So these are some of the questions um, in here. The country team is trying to answer with the data that we're collecting in the field. And it involves engaging communities, involves administering questionnaires, and then some observational work that we do, and then alongside the rodent collection and sampling that we are doing. Well, thank you again, all of you, for the fine work you do. It's obviously more important than ever. I can see uh, the, the possibility of potentially one day uh, providing vaccines for, for animals themselves and, and or finding these other ways to identify uh, risks in animal populations before they can spill over. That would Maybe that's the holy grail. But... Um, in the meantime, thanks again for taking the time to, to speak with us and to answer questions. There's still being, answers are being posted in the Q&A feature uh, online. And uh, once again, we will be posting a recording of this webinar on our website at earthjournalism.net. And we're having a bunch more webinars in the coming days and weeks, so keep a lookout for them. Thank you again, David, Pranav, Grace, James. We really appreciate your time uh, and uh, Let's, you know, stay in touch and keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.